back. We are here on Wednesday morning. We're here to, um, we were going to start our day with Stephanie, but we're going to finish our, our morning with Stephanie. Stephanie, welcome back. Thanks. General Housing Military Affairs. We, we um, invited you back in to do kind of a, you testified last year on H232, which is very similar in some respects to H273, but we want, I wanted you to come back so that you could share with us again some of the um, economic information that this bill in, in, that makes an impact on how we should be considering H273. And so with that, I just um, welcome you back. Um, we are, uh, you weren't here for introductions, so we're going to do a quick round of introductions okay. um, for you. No longer on Zoom, so we have to just sort of let you know who's here. We'll start with uh, Representative Howard. Good morning. I am Mary Howard. I represent um, Rutland City um, 53, the Southwest District. Thank you. Good morning, Stephanie. I think we met last year, possibly, but uh, I'm Chip Troiano, and I represent Hardwick Standard and Walden in the Northeast Kingdom. Thank you. Thanks. Huh? How you doing? Uh, good morning, Stephanie. Uh, again, Representative Matt Byron for Jens, represent Northwest Madison County. Good to see you. You too. Diff Blumley, <clears throat> Chittenden 65 in Burlington South, and your district. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Stephanie. John Collins from South Burlington. Uh, nice morning, to see you. Good morning, Mr. Person. Represent uh, Broughton, Thompson, and Newberry. Thanks. Good morning, John Collins. I represent Milton. Good morning. I'm Tommy Waltz, representing Berry City. Barbara Murphy, serving Fairfax and District <clears throat> 2, Franklin 2. And Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury, representing Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Jules Gore. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you all um, for helping me uh, change the schedule dealing with an emergency I had this morning. Uh, I, I'm here to uh, speak to you about H273 um, from an economic perspective, not so much about the mechanics of the bill, but to give you um, a sense of the way economists think about this. And just to say that my research for the last years has been on issues of inequality uh, and amongst the types of inequality I look at and teach on uh, racial inequality. Uh, so I, I'd like to, um, you know, as I indicated, I, I strongly support this bill. And I think it is very innovative relative to what we have seen in other parts of the country. I think the bill does a great job of talking about historical discrimination, whether that is in private markets or the role of government that has resulted in the significant racial inequality that exists today. One of the things that I don't think that people uh, perhaps emphasize enough is the role of ongoing discrimination uh, in, in our institutions and in the private sector. And I'll offer you some data on that. And I'd also like to talk about what's the impact of a bill like this on racial inequality. So if I might start first, uh, you know, for, in my view, what this bill really does is to deal with wealth inequality. And uh, scholars who are looking at racial inequality have come to realize that wealth inequality is much more significant a problem to address even than income inequality. Why is wealth inequality important? Because wealth is the way wealth, wealth and any kind of savings are the way that households smooth income. During a recession, during COVID, any kinds of crisis, families with means can fall back on their assets to smooth their income, uh, but those without, without means that, is, that, that have low incomes and few assets, they're, they're re the result of these crises for them is homelessness, is bankruptcy, and significant impacts for the long term in their lives, not just a short run effect. Um, wealth can help families smooth medical emergencies. They smooth care emergencies, like having to take time off to care for a, a sick relative and so forth. So wealth is fundamentally important as a component of racial inequality. I think the data that you have seen uh, and in this bill and elsewhere is uh, widespread and I won't belabor it too much on the vast difference in wealth accumulation by black, Latinx and white families. And just as a way to put it into perspective, for every dollar of wealth that white families have, black families uh, at the median have 12 cents of wealth 
and Latinx families, 19 cents. So the disparity is great. Um, I think that sometimes people don't understand that this doesn't have to do with just education and income. Wealth inequality is extremely high, even for people with a postgraduate degree. So for example, um, black households uh, in which uh, the adults have a postgraduate degree have roughly $115,000 wealth compared to 600,000 for white families. Uh, so it, it can't be explained by features such as educational differences. Um, I, for me, uh, the more I be, worked as an economist, the more my concerns are deeply around the impacts on children. Uh, so for, for uh, I'm gonna just read you a quote from Heather McGee that wrote a book called The Sum of Us and the Impact of Racial Inequality. And what she says is, wealth is where history shows up in your wallet, where your financial freedom is determined by compounded interest on decisions made long before you were born. And that is the case today. Um, the future of children dep today uh, depends on today's racial wealth inequality. Wealth inequality is, um, in this generation, for pets, racial wealth inequality in the next generation, either through in vivo transfers, that is transfers within the, when parents are still alive, or through inheritance. And so there is, you know, what we observe is a sedimentation, a layering of wealth inequality, generation after generation after generation. And so if you were to pass this bill, you are not only affecting the current generation of BIPOC Vermonters, but you're also addressing uh, racial inequality between BIPOC Vermonters and white Vermonters in the future. And I think that's significant, important. Uh, I, I will say too, that it also affects education. Many um, BIPOC children are unable to go to college, because of lack of income or assets that their parents can use to fund their education. And one of the impacts of this is that uh, black children in particular and Latinx children have much higher uh, college debt than do white children because of these wealth inequalities. The most significant place that Americans uh, uh, accumulate wealth is through home ownership in the United States. And home ownership, home, home ownership rates differ substantially due to not only past discrimination, but current discrimination. I won't belabor the information about the uh, home ownership rate differences. You've heard that's uh, outlined in the bill, but I would like to talk to you about mortgage denial rates by race. The, the data are quite significant and clear and extensive about mortgage home denial rates. So when you compare groups of People, let's say black, uh, black Americans to white Americans who have the same income, the same education, same credit history, blacks are 80% more likely to be denied a loan. Um, that is you know, through a variety of factors such as implicit bias in the lending process. Uh, nevertheless, the, lo the loan denial rate is very high. Um, in fact, it's greater in New England than it is in the rest of the country. The denial rate for uh, Latinx applicants, and uh, and just to give you a, you know a sense of this, uh, the the denial rate for Latinx applicants and for Black applicants whose incomes are over let's say eighty to hundred thousand dollars is actually the same as whites who apply whose incomes are between thirty one thousand and fifty thousand dollars. So again, income can't explain this. In fact, the much higher income groups that are of color have, high, have higher loan denial rates than much lower income whites. Uh, and I think um, that we don't have specific information for Vermont, a lot of the issues around small sample size, but I was able to obtain some information for Burlington and South Burlington. And what we find here is that BIPOCs, uh, uh, BIPOC Burlingtonians and South Burlingtonians are denied at a rate that is four times greater than white applicants. Now, that study doesn't control for income. So the difference in uh, access to mortgage loans is in part due to income, that is income inequality, but then also d discrimination in loan um, denial rates. On top of that, uh, BIPOC families, when they do pay, uh, when they do obtain loans, they pay significantly higher interest rates. So lenders charge Latinx and Black uh, American borrowers roughly eight percentage points more than white borrowers for mortgages. And this amounts to roughly 
uh, almost uh, $800 billion a year nationally in terms of extra interest that is paid. All of this, of course, inhibits wealth accumulation and hence the importance of a bill like this that it will allow BIPOC Vermonters to access funding for mortgages, for example. Uh, let me speak just briefly also about businesses, which this bill also addresses is the access to lending uh, for mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. And that is that more than half of US companies that have black owners were turned down for loans in 2017, a rate that is twice that of white applicants. So here too, uh, I think there's a significant importance to this bill to address black uh, and BIPOC business ownership. I might add that when they do get loans, uh, it's not perhaps surprising that they also pay uh, higher rates for those loans, that is entrepreneurs. And even when they apply for credit cards, they are denied at a rate that is much higher. Uh, so in, the, in, in short, some form of policy in, intervention is required. Uh, it is to address both the failures of government to curb racial discrimination in mortgage and lending markets, for example, but also due to the role of government in its own policies. Just give you one example, um, the mortgage, um, mortgage interest deduction that those who, of us who are homeowners are allowed to deduct on our income tax gives us a leg up over people who are renters. And to the extent that BIPOC, the BIPOC community disproportionately has not been able to own homes, they don't have access to what amounts to a subsidy for largely white homeowners. So there is, uh, I wanna just make clear the obligation here is a current one because we have other, we have policies at the government level and we have provided insufficient oversight of financial institutions and labor markets to curb discrimination. Uh, and so I, I, I wanna say that, that, um, that um, in fact, some of the evidence shows that if, we, if, if, you, if this bill were able to contribute to the narrowing of racial inequality, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, home ownership and business, uh, act, business entrepreneurial um, startups and so forth, that there is evidence from uh, some reputable studies that the wealth gap could be, uh, if the, the wealth gap could be closed by a roughly 30%. And so I think this makes a significant dent in it if, if this bill were to be passed and it's important to consider. There are also many benefits. And I think this is one of the areas that I study a great deal is what are the benefits and what are the costs of inequality? Inequality by race and by gender is highly costly to the economy. In other words, it's not just people of color and women who suffer from inequality, but actually the economy as a whole functions better, significantly better when there is greater intergroup inequality. And more specifically, for example, a bill like this would contribute to greater human capital, more wealth for families would allow them to fund their children's education. It would lead to increased entrepreneurship. It would lead to a healthier labor force, would lead to smaller stock of student loans, which has significant impacts on the ability of families, people to start families and to invest in their children. And it would also lead to reduced social spending and uh, it would lead to increased tax revenues. So in some ways, bills like this actually pay for themselves because of the benefits of, inequality, the benefits of greater equality, I mean, higher living standards that generate tax revenues uh, that are used to, to fund a program such as this, and also because the social spending that we use to support people who are deprived is reduced as a result of this. So I wanna just end there just to say that I, I strongly support this bill and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Jennifer. Um, a few minutes ago, you referred to the interest data uh -huh. on being 8% higher on, on mortgages. I was just curious if that was something you could share with us. Uh, I, I would love to like read into that a little deeper. Sure. Uh, I actually, in my testimony, I cited the study. Okay. Uh, that is, um, and uh, it is, um, it's actually it, done by a very interesting organization, the Institute for Assets and Social Policy at Brandeis University. And all of their work is how to close the asset and wealth gap. Uh, so uh, it is in my testimony and uh, the link is there. And if you have any trouble finding it, just let me know, I'd be happy to share it. 
I am sure, sure that's more than enough for me to navigate okay. that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Stephanie, if you could step back to the beginning of your testimony, and we've heard this this statistic before about for every dollar, you know, for a dollar of of a white person's wealth, um, that the number is extremely low for um, a black person's wealth. Can you delve into that um, in in ways that I mean? I, I can make illusions in my own mind through my own reading to, to try to understand that. But from an economist perspective, can you just share with us how that how that number came to be? Well, I think it's accumulated over a long period of time. As I, I, I think even if you just even if you just take home ownership, uh, I think the data for Vermont, as I recall, um, are um, Roughly 40% of black households own their homes compared to 78% of white Vermonters. I might be off a bit, but there's a, you know, it's almost double. And um, I'll just take a, if I am, you know, take a case of what happened in the recent, um, the, uh, the recent housing um, uh, fire, if you will, in the mid 2000s. If you remember, housing prices were just climbing astronomically. And in, in my own case, in Burlington, uh, I bought a house for $135,000. And uh, seven years later, the value had increased to $325,000. And so there's roughly $200,000 of um, assets that I generated through no hard effort on my own. But people who don't own homes don't have access to that. So what happens with that? I, I have... Uh, you know, saves resources as a result of that, the, um, the inflation, if you will, of housing prices, and that is income or wealth that I can pass on to my son when he wants to buy a house. So I could be in a position to pay for his mortgage, and he is then able to buy a house that, again, appreciates in value. That's just one way uh, that this wealth inequality occurs. Obviously, it occurs also through owner uh, entrepreneurship. Um, and if you're not able to get a loan to start a business, then you're not able to, to build wealth. And many of those avenues have simply been blocked for uh, Latinx and BIPOC families in general. And I might just say that it's intergenerational, right? So it's, as I said, what we're seeing here is the, you know, the layering of generation after generation after generation of these inequalities. Well, and I think that speaks to um, last year when you talked to us, you talked a lot about redlining, about the concept of not just redlining, but also the availability. So, so you know, my father was, uh, my parents were low income, but my father qualified for a GI loan to buy a house, which was not available to uh, a person of color. Um, right. At that in the, in the late 1950s, um, is that what you're talking about in terms of layering about you know where there's a chunk of time where certain right. in financial instruments, even though there was there was supposed to be an equality involved, that there were certain financial instruments that were not available. Is that what we are talking about with layering? That yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, that's exactly right. So you know that is a layer that happened you know 80 years ago. But, uh, and, and it is ongoing, uh, yeah. I, I might just add, you know, the Homestead Act in the 1850s, which opened up the West to white, white settlers was a place that uh, was a, a, one, of, you know, one of the factors that led to vast differences in land ownership in the United States as well. So there we really could rehearse a number of policies, government policies throughout history, as well as the government turning a blind eye to discriminatory practices. Um, I'll just tell you a brief story, if I might. Uh, I don't often um, relay personal information, but I think sometimes it's important to understand how uh, these things are still with us today in Vermont, where we like to believe that we're different. Uh, my son uh, applied for an apartment in Burlington a few years ago, and he identifies as African-American, and the landlord turned him down. He said it wasn't so much that he was opposed to an African-American renting there. He said, but the people downstairs would be bothered. Um, this goes on every single day. So uh, having 
government take a firm stand about the unacceptability of racial discrimination and barriers to people being able to get access to assets that help them leave a dignified and decent life and to support their children is fundamentally important. Uh, this is you know, the way that we are gonna move forward is when government takes a stand such as this bill does to undermine those practices that daily happen to BIPOC Vermonters. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Stephanie. I am, you cited um, <clears throat> data from Burlington and South Burlington and the denial, <clears throat> the mortgage denial rates. Um, and in what you said, I want to make sure that I understand. So that you, <clears throat> you were saying that it, it wasn't um, further broken down by income um, so that you would know, <clears throat> because the statistics that you quoted earlier noted that <clears throat> um, uh, there was a real difference in, oh gosh, the, <laughs> the approval rate um, based on income for blacks and for whites. Okay, does that, did that make any sense? Totally, yeah, I got it. <laughs> yeah, uh, so. Is, is that something that can be done or is that information not available? <clears throat> um, you, just froze on me. you just froze on I'm me. I'm sorry. So, yeah. Uh, well, I was just wondering is that data that one can get, um, you know, that income sensitivity to and the, the correlation with the denial, um, and then broken out by race, gender, whatever? Yeah, um, the, uh, so yes, you, you can. So it's, it's from the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council. Um, I, I actually came across this in a city of Burlington study. I wasn't able to access the data in time for this uh, testimony. Uh, I tend to be careful in these things. Most studies that look at denial rates try to care, compare apples to apples. In other words, people with the same credit history um, same income, same educational background, some other factors like that. This one may have, but it wasn't obvious to me in the data. So I, I because the the denial rate was so much higher than even New England, uh, my sense was that it it probably did not control for income. Uh, but it, they they certainly do have the data. Thanks very much. Yeah. All right, any further questions for Stephanie at this time? Stephanie, thank you for providing the testimony verbally and for, and for the written testimony. Um, it's really, um, you know, we're still just gathering this information about understanding what we talk about when we talk about wealth disparity, basically, or wealth inequality. Um, I think, I think it's important for us to just take in as much information and try to understand it from a, you know, from a historical and local perspective um, mm -hmm. of, what it, of what it means. So thank you for, for filling us in. And if we have further questions or if we, you know, we may invite you back mm -hmm. over the course of the bill for some clarification stuff too, some, some background stuff too. So thank you for being available today. You're very welcome. Thanks so much. And thanks for all your work. Bye.